What's up, guys? We are in another episode, another Care Pods podcast, whatever you may call it. We have a special guest, Dr. Adam Wright, good friend of mine, great ortho surgeon here in the Dallas Metroplex. Uh, our story is kind of crazy. A couple years ago, I wanted to reach out to doctors and find a way to relate to them and create relationships. So we did an initial podcast and uh, we sat down and got to know each other and found out we had a lot in common. Like both love God, both love our wives, both are passionate about healthcare and, el and elderly people and both had kids and we just had a lot of synergy in them. We would consistently meet up every other month or so and just at La Madeline and uh, we were like, man, this is a great relationship. We've become really good friends and, and uh, we work together uh, as well. He uh, does uh, ortho surgeries on his patients and we have the opportunity to take care of them on home health services post-op. And so this podcast is really broken in two different episodes, one specifically talking about uh, what an ortho surgeon does and how he um, takes care of himself and how does he have good work-life balance, also uh, just the process of uh, surgery. And so we're actually gonna take uh, a couple snippets and we're gonna go through him breaking down uh, the actual surgery uh, of a knee and of a hip. And so you, you all can see that and it's just gonna be fun. So uh, hope you guys enjoy this podcast, uh, this episode uh, with Dr. Adam Wright. Well, Dude. Good Always to good to see you. It's good to, good to catch up with you. So, Dr. Wright's a good friend of mine, but he's a, an amazing orthopedic surgeon. Uh, one of the things we talked about when we first met was there's just not a lot of good education, like for, for families, for people who are interested in, in getting a joint replacement, people who are interested in, in like knee surgery or even like therapy or um, injections. And so, we were like, let's just talk about like what does it look like for families to, to have some good education. And, uh, Dr. Wright is one, I'm biased, he's a good friend of mine, but I'm biased in, in terms of making sure that families get good education. And so we were like, let's just chat, you know, yeah. and let's just talk about things. And so if you, if you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about yourself in general, um, what got you into being a surgeon, and we can go from there. Sure, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think you know, the education is really important, and mm -hmm. surgery is scary, going to the doctor is scary. So if you can at least know part of the process and have some light on the subject before you show up, it makes it a little easier. Yeah. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, uh, born and raised in Texas. I have three brothers, and one of my brothers had cerebral palsy. Mm. Uh, because of that, everything that I saw helping my parents take care of him, I really got exposure to the medical field in mm. good and bad ways mm. as I was growing up. Um, I, I saw how hard it is to be on the patient side of things, and I really loved the science. And I was I always loved math and science and uh, getting involved in all that. And I, medicine seemed like the perfect fit for me. Mm -hmm. And I had always wanted to be a doctor since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. Somehow I actually got to see open heart surgery at Jeez. age 10 uh, in the OR. Wow. And from then wait, on- Wait, how'd that happen? Hold on. <laughs> yeah, just bring, oh, bring your son to work day. That's you know? amazing. <laughs> sort of. Uh, well, my best friend's dad was a perfusionist. So he's a PA that runs the heart lung machine. Oh, wow. Uh, and he was allowed to bring his kids uh, to actually be in scrubs in the operating room to observe what, what he does. Man. Funny enough, me and his son are, are both doctors now. That's because so they, cool, because of exposure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, and so from age 10, I tell everybody, I wanna be a cardiothoracic surgeon. They looked at you like, oh, okay, yeah. okay, you will be that. <laughs> right, uh, and you know, I, I changed orthopedics instead for, yeah, yeah, for yeah. various reasons, yeah. but uh, I loved surgery from the beginning because wow. just the chance to change somebody's life immediately hmm. and take a problem that can't be fixed and then you can fix it. Um, hmm. And then you get to see great anatomy, uh, y you get to learn a skill that almost nobody has, uh, and you really help people through a process. It was what I wanted to do, hmm. I knew from the beginning. Wow. In college, I thought about orthopedics maybe instead of cardiothoracics, uh, simply because I really liked the orthopedic guys, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be Turk from Scrubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah, then al sure. also, the patients are really cool. Yeah. They're all motivated. Uh, they want to get back to doing the things they like to do. Mm. Uh, a lot of them are athletes. Uh, and so I just really got along with those type of people. Mm. Cardiothoracic patients are a little sicker, it's a little harder, mm. and yeah. it's, it, it can be sad. Yeah. You know? yeah. It can be hard. So wow. I just naturally gravitated towards that, and that's kind of where I wound up. That's crazy. That's crazy. So, so now, like, you look back, like, if you look back on like, that path, and you were to say, okay, like, someone who's considering like either going this route or this route, like what would you recommend for that person? Like, you know, someone who's going into school. Right? First thing I'd say is have an open mind. I mean, mm. 
it was a very hard decision for me, even thinking I was pretty sure I wanted to do ortho all through medical school. Uh, I, I loved ENT, I mm. thought about emergency medicine, I loved acute care trauma surgery. Mm. And it, there's so many ways, if your goal is to help somebody, yeah. to accomplish that goal. Yeah. And you might be surprised what you like. Yeah. Um, now, certainly there are things that you will realize match your personality better, or even just the people around you in that field. It just feels like home. Uh, and it just felt like home. Hmm. Was there any like, you know, one of the things we were talking about right before was kind of really breaking down, you know, specifically people who are interested in becoming an orthopedic surgeon mm -hmm. or becoming a doctor, right? I know a lot of times, you know, like the title doctor can kind of weigh on people. Is there, have you, did you ever experience that when like you, when you were going in, you, okay, you wanted to do cardiothoracic surgeon, then ortho, did it, did it bother you that you had to, that you switched, right? What, how did you deal with that? Just curious. You mean like instead of being a surgeon rather than a doctor? Yeah. Well, I think just like anything, you take pride in your identity. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when you know that this is what you do and this is your skill set, you know, then that really becomes a part of you and you get excited to claim that. Yeah. And excited to learn that. Yeah. And when you start off and you start residency, it doesn't matter what you're going mm. to residency for you feel like a fraud because you don't know anything yet <laughs> you know and you get to introduce yourself as the orthopedic surgery resident you know in the beginning you definitely emphasize the resident because you're like i don't know anything yeah yet. you know and you yeah. really realize very quickly how much you don't know and if you mm. were a real learner you keep that attitude your whole life mm. and you keep that humility so you keep learning mm. but towards the end of residency you realize hey i actually do know what i'm talking about I i've learned this i've seen this before mm. which is a great feeling mm. and that builds confidence mm -hmm. so it's like basically saying hey be confident in who you are as a person and right. then kind of go from there. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So what led you to actually be an orthopedic surgeon? Or would you say like, particularly joint replacements, what like caught your eye when you were thinking about being a surgeon? So there are, I mean, at this point, I think probably 10 subspecialties within orthopedics. Oh, wow. Oh, and, right. and most people think orthopedics is just feet, you know, which it, that's one of them, <laughs> foot and ankle for sure. You know, but you know, trauma, tumor, sports, shoulder and elbow is one, uh, joint replacement, hip preservation, mm. pediatrics. Yeah. Uh, there's so much within one field. I loved joint replacement for several reasons. Mm. Uh, the patients are great. Mm. You know, they love their families, they love hanging out, doing fun things. They want to get back to it. They were usually good at something before and just time mm. and arthritis has taken them out of the game and they want to get back. And so that is a very fun group of people to work with. Mm. Also, it's usually older patients. Now, not as much as it used to be. We're expanding our indications and people are getting arthritis younger and younger. Mm. Uh, but I think old people are great. Yeah, yeah. They, I like them. Yeah, I, yeah I, I love them. They, they have perspective on life. Mm. People our age, I think, are the worst sometimes because we yeah. don't have any perspective on life and the pain is the worst yeah. you've ever felt. And Lack people, of wisdom, too. Yeah. <laughs> people who have had arthritis for 20 years, they know what real pain is. And, and when they tell you something hurts, you believe them because they've been through it. Uh, and I think they're, they're just happy people, mm. you know, people that have been around the block, they have wisdom, mm. uh, and they're great. Mm. They, they usually listen to what you tell them. Mm. They want to get better and they want to be good patients. Hmm. That's cool. That's a good point. Did you did you ever have to, did you ever get the opportunity to, in residency, I guess, shadow joint replacements and do that? Is that kind of what led you to that as oh, well? Oh yeah, it's a mandatory rotation. Yeah, you, know, okay. you, you can't go call yourself an orthopedic surgeon and not how to do a, a hip replacement. Yeah, because okay. you're taking call typically as you're getting started in your career. Hmm. People fall and break hips. It's one of the most common orthopedic injuries that's out there and you have to know how to manage that. Wow. So it's required to do a certain amount of these cases as you graduate residency hmm. uh, to, to even be certified. However, once you get into practice, I think the average orthopedic surgeon does eight hip replacements in a year, which wow. is not a lot. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I may do that in a week, yeah, you know, yeah. but that's because that's what I do. Mm. Uh, but I, you have to get the experience in joint replacement mm. to graduate residency. What was it like going into your first like joint replacement? Do you remember? Like I, I remember. So uh, my first surgery rotation, even as a medical student, yeah. uh, I'd gotten an elective in orthopedics. And my first case, they, I mean, they taught me how to scrub in right before I went into the surgery, Whew. was a hip replacement. And the residents were kind of playing some pranks on me since I was the new guy, you know. 
And one of the things when you do a joint replacement surgery is you, you crank your hood down and you, we wear these surgical hoods. And they told me that you need to make sure and crank this thing down as hard as you possibly can because you don't want it falling off at surgery. You're going to get kicked out, you know, get fired or whatever. So I, I did. I mean, I did exactly <laughs> what they told me to do. And then, you know, you got an ear splitting headache about 20 minutes into oh the surgery. <laughs> now, fortunately, you could adjust it, you know, but uh, it was the, the resident that was doing the surgery was terrible at it. It took five hours. And I thought, well, I don't know what I want to do in orthopedic, but it's definitely not joint replacement. Wow. Then I realized it's actually awesome, yeah, you know, if yeah. you know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, over time, I realized, no, this is the best part of orthopedics, I think. Wow, that's cool. Wow, that's crazy. So so what are some of, like, the most common joint, like, conditions and injuries that you encounter, like, just in general? I see a lot of hips and knees. Okay. Um, and with knees, there's several things that will happen for a lot of people. Uh, you know, meniscus tears um, and arthritis are kind of the main things that we okay. see. Um that's usually just dependent on, you know, if it's a meniscus tear or, or arthritis, and very often people have both. Uh, sports injuries or things that just kind of gradually get worse over time. Mm -hmm. uh, on the hip side of things, you know, arthritis is a very common thing that I see. Fractures are common. Okay. Not as much in clinic, that's more in the ER, but I do have people even show up in clinic with a broken hip that yeah. fell this morning and wow. just got in to see us. Um, and then bursitis, okay. muscle tendon tears, we see all of those sort of things pretty regularly. What's a good, what's the bursitis, if someone didn't know that? What, what is that? Bursi bursitis, tendonitis is one of the most common things I see around the hip. Mm -hmm. People will typically complain of pain on the side of their hip. It's worse when they're sleeping on that side. Mm -hmm. Hurts going from sitting to standing or transitional movements. Hurts going up and down stairs. Uh, and it's, it's usually isolated to one spot. People don't even really realize how painful this is mm -hmm. until you kind of poke on the area and they jump off the table and you say, oh yeah, that's that's the spot. That's oh. where it hurts. It's very treatable too, which is one of the great things about seeing it. Anti-inflammatories, mm -hmm. physical therapy, injections usually takes care of it. It's not cool. something that you typically need a surgery for. Okay. So okay. that's good news. Whenever good. you go to the surgeon, they can tell you don't have to have surgery. That's, good. that's a good day. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's like the last thing in the world is like, oh, I just got the hip. Right. My hip is hurting and then now I got to go into surgery. Right. That's crazy. Wow. That's cool. What, um, what are some things that, that you've seen just in general with your experience and a patient's having like bursitis or having constant arthritis, what are some of the things in terms of treatments that are non-surgical that are like really common for, for patients to consider? So very often I'll tell someone they have arthritis of the hip or the knee and uh, it's not unusual for them to cry actually sometimes. Mm. And, and then a lot of other people, they know it's coming. You know, they're not surprised that they have diagnosed it themselves. So the reaction can be all across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're worried and if they're nervous, I can tell them there's a lot of things we can do. Mm -hmm. This is a very treatable condition. And of course, the nuclear option is surgery, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's a good option. Yeah. But before then, there's all sorts of things that help. So uh, there's things like I call the easy stuff. They may or may not be easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, weight loss, right? Uh, it's not easy. It's, it's easy, easy to say, <laughs> but not easy to do, yeah, especially yeah. when your joints hurt. Mm. Um, physical therapy, that's very good. It mm. keeps the muscles strong. It keeps you moving, which mm. helps the joint function better. Anti-inflammatories, mm. a great option for most people, but those medicines aren't great for your stomach or your kidneys, and they can interfere with blood pressure medicines, hmm. uh, blood thinners, and there's lots of reasons why maybe you shouldn't take them long term. Yeah. Injections, lots of different flavors of those. Um, braces, depending on the hmm. joint. There's a lot of things that we can do short of cutting somebody open. Hmm. But if those things fail, that's one. We have a great option too. That's good. Wow, wow. So now, now let's let's talk about you know someone that's needing surgery, like. Say, for instance, you've, you've done everything they need to do, like gone through the easy stuff, right? Right. What, they walk into your office and now it's like, hey, we gotta get ready for surgery. What, what are some of the things, the most common questions that you may hear from families like, or a patient, they say, all right, I'm going into surgery. Like, what are some of the questions they ask? Yeah. Right off the bat? I think the most common question I get is how long is the surgery gonna last? Hmm. Which always makes me laugh inside because you're going to be asleep, sleep, you know? <laughs> like, what else are you doing that yeah, day, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, just, it just makes me laugh because, I mean, you're I tell patients you're not going to remember yeah. half the day. They're like, you know? they're and open. So, they're done, yeah, you're going to, exactly. And, and very often I'll tell people, well, this is the last thing you're going to remember because <laughs> the anesthesiologist is going to come in next yeah. and give you the good drugs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, usually the surgery itself, I tell people it's about an hour. Okay. Now they'll be in the room for about two hours, typically to 
to get you positioned. That takes some time to put you off to sleep. Uh, what people don't know, when you're asleep in your bed, you're kind of rolling around, you're moving. Yeah. When you're anesthetically asleep, you're out. You don't move at all. So we make sure and pad you. You know, if you don't want your elbow resting on something mm. or have a crick in your neck when mm. you wake up. So that takes some time to make sure people are well padded. Mm. Um, and then we clean off the leg. There's usually several different types of scrubs that we do. Uh, then we do the surgery, mm -hmm. it takes about an hour. Mm -hmm. But then we wake you up and make sure you get transferred over to the, the stretch that you came in on. And so all in all, room time is about two hours. Wow, wow. But it's very important to be quick and efficient with the surgery. Mm -hmm. You don't want the incision open a long time. Yeah. So the cutting time, yeah. as we call it, is about an hour. Yeah. So now let's, let's talk about, I know a lot of families and patients are like concerned about medications. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about like, if you don't mind, some of the medications that generally most orthopedic, orth orthopedic surgeons use like for a joint replacement, either in the surgery, post-op, what are some common medications that? Oh, there can easily be 10 to 15 different types of medicines, yeah. which sounds like a lot and it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but each one has a specific purpose. Uh -huh. um, typically now we're using what's called a multimodal pain regimen, which okay. means we're attacking pain every way you can feel it. And pain is the thing people are usually most worried about right. when it comes to surgery. Uh, they're also worried about narcotics. Yeah. Everyone knows about the opioid epidemic. Yeah. And I mean, things have changed even since I was a resident. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to just give people 95 narcotic pills because that was the most we could prescribe and we we didn't want them to have to bother us with refills. Yeah, yeah. Now we give them about 20 or 30 because they probably won't need much more right, than that, right, which right. is shocking. Right. Um, there are narcotics, which everyone knows about, mm -hmm. and we typically give two different types, a weak one and a strong one, and yeah. say, take it if you need it. And most of the time we're not even refilling the strong one or mm -hmm. people don't take m many at all. Mm -hmm. Tylenol is very important. Uh, and many people think, well, Tylenol doesn't work for me. Well, it may not in isolation, but combined with everything else, it will be helpful. Yeah. And the doses we're giving are much bigger than people are used to. Gotcha. Uh, Anti-inflammatory medicines, both NSAIDs and steroids, have a very important part uh, to play in surgical recovery. Hmm. There are medicines that interfere with clotting in mm. good and bad ways. And one that we use can actually help with stiffness and keeps people from bleeding, which is important. Yeah, and That's actually how we have been able to decrease the amount of blood transfusions. It's extremely rare for someone to have a blood transfusion after yeah, surgery. It is, yeah. A lot of my Jehovah's Witness patients ask mm -hmm. about this all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's very, very rare. Mm. Wow. In fact, I don't think I've ever given someone a blood transfusion from just a primary surgery. Which means wow. just a simple joint replacement. I don't, it's never happened. Wow, wow. Now, there are also blood thinners we give because okay. you don't want a blood clot after surgery. The other thing you don't want is an infection, so we give antibiotics too. Mm. Uh, you can have muscle spasms, so we give muscle relaxants. Surgery is stressful, your stomach can hurt. We Boom. give you some, an antacid. Yeah. You can get constipated, so we give you some something yeah. just in case. Yeah. You could be nauseated, so we give medicine for that. You don't have to you take hit all, all the things. areas basically. You're right. hitting all the areas to prepare and make right. sure. Yeah. But these are all things that can happen. These are all things that you might get. Wow. And then there's anesthesia. You yeah, know, all, all that too. That was, you're gone after that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's but, crazy. But even then, we use numbing medicines in the operating room uh, of several yeah, different types. Yeah, walk us types. through that. Like, yeah. Most you know, knee surgeries are a little different than hip surgeries. For knees, there are several different, what, what's called a block, where they can target specific nerves that go to the back or the front of the knee. Mm -hmm. uh, and the anesthesiologist will do that. I also do that during surgery. I fill the joint with numbing medicine, which is mm. helpful. Um, and during the surgery, people will typically get a spinal, which means that they are numb from the waist down only for an hour or two, which mm -hmm. is about what you need for the surgery, yeah. uh, which decreases their pain and inflammation and everything else. Yeah. Now for a hip, there are several different nerves that you can somewhat target, but you do have to be able to walk eventually. Mm -hmm. And so we'll use a spinal for the surgery, but after that, um, the numbing medicine we leave in the OR mm -hmm. helps for typically several days. Wow. So after, I know people sometimes get scared of the word spinal, like a spinal yes. block. What are some things that you say to families to say, hey, like, to kind of ease their fear when it comes to, like, being not able to, like, walk or something? It's you know? usually mostly the men who are scared of it. <laughs> yeah, because the ladies say, oh, it's just like yeah, when I had yeah, a baby. Yeah. And you say it's actually not even that bad because <laughs> they left it in for a while. This yeah. is just a one-shot spinal. Yeah, yeah. It's quick and easy, yeah. and then it, and it doesn't last very long, mm. uh, which is good because people are up and walking, like going little, home yeah, the same, same day. day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, so it's really just kind of easing them, helping them understand what the what the purpose of it is. Right. That's cool. Wow, right. that's awesome. And some patients 
they have to be awake during surgery because their heart can't handle it and a spinal is very often the safest mm. way. Many patients say, that is really creepy. I don't want that. Knock, Knock me, me out. out. And I said, that's fine. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it. You know, wow. But uh, there, there's all sorts of ways to get things done just depending on what the patient needs. That's cool. Now, some of the patients that have had to be awake for surgery, I do make them pick the radio station. Oh, you know, nice. And they don't have to sing along, but yeah. every once in a while, if the, the medicine's right, they will. That's cool. Um, That's cool. We've had people request you know, Broadway show tunes or, you know. Disney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, classic rock, um, all, all sorts of things. That's cool. That's cool. All right. If you're watching this, thank you so much. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe this video. Let's keep it moving. Now let's kind of walk through the actual surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so we were thinking, we were talking beforehand, we could probably have a video that we would like sure. to, have, to have you kind of walk through and just kind of guide families through what, what it is that you're doing. So, yeah. So let's, let's take a look at this video here real quick. This is the video that scares everybody. I know, yeah. Because in that picture, so, they just go. took a huge chunk out of the knee. All right, so starting off normally, you open up the incision and you need to actually be able to see to put the pieces in. So they flip the patella up on the side and usually you replace that. And here, they take a huge chunk out of bone out on both the femur <laughs> and the tibia. That's not really how we do that. I, I typically tell patients, this is how we used to do it, or you can do it like this. Sometimes I do that in Europe, but here in the United States, that's not how we do it. So this is like, you said, this, this, this one really scares This is people. the one that scares people because yeah. they think that, well, you have to amputate my leg in the middle of surgery. And that's, mm. that's not quite true. Mm. What we're doing here, typically when I'm doing this surgery, when a modern surgeon does this you're, you're taking small slivers of bone about eight millimeters or less yeah. here they just cut off bottom half of the femur there <laughs> uh, you can do that it just doesn't feel natural so see that huge gap yeah you know that's that's what people are worried about now mm. this part is right where you put something into the tibia mm -hmm. uh, and then you put something on the femur this is a little different mm -hmm. design wise um, but then, then, yeah, then it moves back and forth. And there's a metal piece that goes in. That's the part that's coming in. That's the patella. Mm -hmm. Of course, your tendons are normally attached to it. There they go. They cam back. Gotcha. And then, then you oh. put it all back together. Oh. Well, it's that easy. You know? It's that easy, man. Because, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of families are like, literally, they just go and they Google. Yes, I know. Knee replacement. Oh, my, when my dad has knee replaced a year ago, he was sending me videos every day. Of like, is it like this? And I'd be like, Dad, no. And then it causes fear. Like, and they're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, now seeing that, I can yeah. see, why. <laughs> see why. This is showing the knee with arthritis. Hmm. The models always have it as red, and it's kind of pink when it gets down to bone. Uh, now, this part right here is showing you when all the pieces are in, what does it actually look like? Mm. Of course, none of your muscles and tendons are in this picture. We like to leave all of those as much as we can. There are some that are either worn out from arthritis or we have to take out to put some of the pieces in. But typically, all of your tendons we, we keep there. Mm. Usually the ACL has to be sacrificed or is already gone. Mm. Um, but the PCL, the way I do it is we like to keep it as much as we can. Your MCL, your LCL, we keep those pieces unless they're worn out and then we compensate for it. Oh, sweet. So that's the patella up front. You got your femur up top, tibia on the bottom. It's a typical incision. You're making it over the front of the knee, and then you kind of spread the skin out underneath, and then you get into the joint itself. You flip over the kneecap like that. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we'll replace that, especially if there's damage, and then you make cuts that look just like this. So uh, a flat cut on the tibia, the bottom bone flat cut across the patella and you'll replace that with what's called a button and then on the femur you make several different angled cuts where you're just taking a few millimeters of bone off mm -hmm. so that you can basically put an end cap on either one of them mm -hmm. but you can see that the ligaments are still there they're still in place and we depend on those for the knee to function properly mm -hmm. so then this is what the pieces look like once you put it in and there are Many different brands, but they all are pretty similar in how they're designed. And that's kind of what it looks like inside the bone. You have to anchor it inside the bone in some way, either with a little peg or um, a, a bigger peg or cement. Sometimes you can actually make it so that the bone grows into mm. it, but they have to stick to the bone somehow. Mm. And so that's how it moves. It glides nice and smoothly. And we try and keep the basic mechanics of the knee once we replace it and put it together. 
That's awesome. So that cement, I'm just curious now, you mentioned the, the cement that's going in there. Mm-hmm. Right in there, what does that entail? Like, is it something that, like, it grows into the bone, or how does that work? I'm so just curious. There, there are basically two main ways to get something to stick to bone. The most common way is to cement it in place, which mm-hmm. is, I, I'd describe as glue. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A grout is probably more accurate. Uh, but it's it bonds both to the implant and it you know, bones are very porous and so if you take it and pressurize it it will get into the bone and then it kind of unitizes it together hmm. uh, that's how we've done it for a long time hmm. in, in both hips and knees now we are now switching over especially in, in the hips in the United States most of the time we're not using cement at all hmm. um, we're starting to do that in the knee as well hmm. the reason for that is it, theoretically if it if the bone grows into the metal, into the implant, it might be able to last you the rest of your life, Hmm. which is ideal, Mm -hmm. and especially as our patients are getting younger, that's the way we want to go. Right, right. Wow. So here's our our model, and this is what the muscles look like underneath. Uh, And you can see there's a lot of muscles and there's a lot of planes. There's a lot of ways to get to the hip. Uh, The way that I do it and the way that a lot of more modern surgeons are doing this is going from the front. Uh, What that does is it takes advantage of a plane in between muscles instead of cutting them off. Mm. So that's what your skeleton looks like. That's where you're ultimately trying to get is to the ball and socket hip joint. There's a lot of complex anatomy around there. There's the acetabulum, which is the socket, the femoral head, which is the ball, and the femur, which is you know, the rest of your leg, obviously. But you have to make sure that you're explaining those terms to patients mm. as you're going through it. Um, or they'll say, bless you. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so that you can see that's how it moves but as you get arthritis the ball isn't round the socket isn't spherical you know, pieces of them can break away or you can get bone spurs that will interfere with motion the hip gets stiff um, and it, it, sometimes depending on the condition it can even collapse so that's kind of what you're dealing with that's what you're trying to fix so then you have to make an incision on the skin um, and this is showing you those muscle planes and the way that they're going to get to it um, but typically, even an anterior approach, you'll still have it's the incision sort of on the front, but sort of on the side uh, versus in the back, which is what most people are used to. Those are the muscles you want to leave intact, the, the rotator muscles of the hip. And then as your hamstrings, you should hopefully never see those, but you have to make sure that they're intact as you're going through and doing the approach. And, and these are the rotator muscles. The, if you're going from the back, you cut those off. These are your adductor muscles. These are the ones that bring your hip across your body. Those you should be able to keep alone in, in most, most approaches. And this is you know, your rectus muscle. This is a hip flexor and also helps extend your knee. This one you will see, so you have to be careful with it. So kind of on the front, kind of on the side. You enter in through, you get between these two layers of muscles, and then you can see the hip. Uh, that's what it looks like when you're all said and done, where you have the brand new stem, the ball, the socket, and the liner in the socket when you're all finished looks pretty much like that and it actually can be pink mm, believe it or not really yeah there we typically are using a, a ball that's made out of a ceramic and so you take the old ball off um, and you actually don't need it anymore after that you could use it for some spare bone if you needed then you prepare the socket where you put in a, a metal socket with a liner then you put a stem inside the femur with a, a new ball on top and there are varying sizes of all these mm-hmm. Um, and so you can customize to the patient exactly what they need. And in this model in particular, they've made it such that it's what we call press fit, so the, the bone should grow into these implants. Like exactly. <laughs> it, it, it does make that noise. Does it really? It, yeah, if no you way. do it right. What's nice about doing these from the front is patients tend to bounce back a little quicker. A, a, a hip surgery, a, you know, a replacement is a great surgery. Mm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Lancet Journal, but it's one of the big mm. scientific journals, mm. you know, kind of like New England Journal of Medicine mm-hmm. that people mm-hmm. just heard of. They said that the hip replacement surgery is the surgery of the century because of how much it has brought people's quality of life. That's back. pretty cool. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you do it from the front, the back, the side, at a year, it's still everybody's doing better. Yeah. Precautions. So anterior approach, are there precautions post-op? We have looked into this. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you give your patients precautions or not, there's no difference in dislocation. It doesn't mm-hmm. really seem to do anything from the front. Mm-hmm. Uh, often in the back too. It, mm. it really, I just tell people, don't be crazy. 
keep your hip close to you. Yeah. Don't don't cross your legs like I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but really, just think about your movements. Don't do anything extreme, uh, and don't you know bend over too far, and it should be fine. Mm. I, we are twisting your leg and moving it in all sorts of different planes yeah. during surgery. We try and simulate most things people would do. Mm. Uh, typically, as long as you don't fall, you should be okay. Hmm. Okay, so now like we've got through the surgery, and surgery's done, and now they're they're going into their room in the hospital. What's what is life after that? What is the next steps for them to recover to get back to like what they enjoy to do, which right. is like golf or so you know so hanging after, out with the grandkids. You oh know? yeah. Uh, you're done with surgery, what happens next? Mm -hmm. That is very different now than it was even three mm. or four years ago. Yeah. Now, most patients are going home the same day of surgery, which terrifies a lot of people, yeah. which that makes sense. Yeah. This is major surgery and we're just sending people home. Yeah. Well, we found that it's very safe to do that. Patients actually tend to really like it. Mm. Uh, one, no hospital food. Because, exactly. You get <laughs> your own food, and you know the nurses do a great job, but they can't get to you immediately. Mm. If you need a pain pill at home, it's right there. Yeah. You know, you, you have your own bed. Yeah. People aren't checking your vital signs ten times a night. Now, sleep. there are certainly patients that need to be at the hospital. So if they need to be there, they get to stay there, mm -hmm. and we keep an eye on them. Therapy works with them, but. If you go home, mm -hmm. there becomes the house. They mm -hmm. come and they check on you. Mm -hmm. You're not exposed to the viruses and colds and flus yeah. that are at the hospital. Yeah. All the hospital transmitted diseases you don't get exposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you start working right away. Mm -hmm. You start working with therapy, the exercises that we give patients, and we want you to get your motion back and mm -hmm. be as normal as you're allowed to be pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. All in all, joint replacement recovery, there's certain parts of it that take a year. We're on your body's yeah. timeline for certain things. Yeah. Uh, it, just swelling takes a while. It takes months to build muscle. That doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Yeah. But functional recovery is very quick. Hmm. Uh, we tell patients you're 89% done two or three months after surgery. Hmm. Uh, if you're working from home, people can often get back on the computer mm -hmm. two to four weeks after surgery. Mm -hmm. If you're a manual laborer, it's probably going to be six to eight weeks before you're ready to go back because we don't want you to go back too soon or hurt That's yourself. Really uh, but you know, if you're doing computer work, hmm. I mean, basically, if you're not taking narcotics, you can work. You can work, yeah. Uh, you definitely can't work while you're on that. Yeah. Uh, but I want your joint to be the priority in recovery. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to write patients for whatever time off they need, mm -hmm. as long as they can do the work they need to to participate with therapy. Mm. So uh, you, you reminded me of something. So my, like uh, my my son's teacher. Uh, calls uh, kids like if they're doing really well like a rock star yeah right or they're doing pretty well they're going to be a rock star right, right? encouraging what are some patients that you've seen that are like rock stars in terms of like they do really well post-op and then why what would you what would you think yeah, we were actually say? talking about this today oh in really the brain room yeah uh, and we kind of said that on average, it seems like women recover a little better than men. Man, we're just not yeah. doing well in life I right know, now, right? But, but, <laughs> but the rock stars are typically the guys, like the people that just bounce right, back. Put, you're I, like, I, that's I unbelievable. Okay, you know, yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, very yeah, often like yeah. the old ranchers. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. just bounce back. But, but sometimes... With you the worry, skin. You, yeah, you worry about the rock stars a little bit because they will push it too far. <sighs> yeah, like that's true. when you get the picture seven days after surgery. Can I do this? Yeah. <laughs> no. When you get the picture of someone who has just killed a deer, you know, with their surgical bandage still intact, you're like, well, you should not be doing that. Oh or gosh. how far are you hauling that thing? <laughs> you know. Or when people go out golf, golfing ten <laughs> days later, you're like, what are you doing? Wow. Calm down. You know, you're gonna get that's yourself true. in trouble. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So kind of so you almost don't want to advertise the rock stars because okay. you don't want yeah. people to we'll do that, that all the time. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, I mean, we have we have patients that go back to skiing, ice skating, mm. taekwondo, all those kind of things. That's cool. uh, and really, you know, a lot of people can do that. Yeah, yeah. Your pre-surgery functional level very okay. often predicts how well you will do. Yeah, and that becomes your next new baseline, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. So now, just as we kind of come to a close, like what what would you recommend? So there's, I read a statistic. There's like a million people a year that are getting joint replacements. That sounds about right. And and so like if that's the case, and someone we know is going to get a joint replacement, mm -hmm. what would you recommend to someone if they're in a lot of pain, you know, and that you know that they need or like. Say for instance, their aunt and uncle, they you know that they need, so I, and you, they're just not listening. What, yeah. what would you recommend to kind of help them understand 
and ease their ease their frustrations or even just ease their uh, angst you yeah. know, about that. One thing I try and communicate to patients and families is that there is hope. Mm. You know, if you're ready for surgery, that's very often hopeful and, and people will say they're surprised to be excited for surgery. Mm. Um, and, and if you're scared of surgery and you're not ready for that yet, there's still hope there too. There's mm. almost always something we can do. Mm. Um, don't be afraid of the unknown because there are lots of doctors out there that want to get you better, mm. want to talk you and walk you through the process. Mm. Don't be fearful, do your homework, find a surgeon that cares about you and if you don't jive with that person that's okay yeah, yeah. Like, people have different personalities yeah. sometimes you get along with your therapist sometimes you don't yeah. and you need to make sure that the people that are taking care of you are invested in you too mm. that's a good point because you mentioned that like I think a lot of times patients may feel afraid of like if you don't feel comfortable with that one doctor that it's not it's like taboo not to go find another doctor yeah. Like you said, I mean, like you have to be comfortable with that right. doctor. Yeah, that's really good. Right, and you know, some of us doctors don't have the best personality. We're mm -hmm. we're stressed. Sometimes we don't spend as much time as we'd want to with people. Yeah. But if if you feel like you're not being heard, that's important. Mm. That's true, man. That's really good. And I think people will recover better if they feel that way too. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Man, that's awesome. Man, Dr. Wright, thanks for hopping Dude, on. That was good. This is good. It's great. This is really great. Right? Love going through these things. This is awesome. Yeah. So if you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Wright as well. He's available. Um, but it's my good friend, so we're always going to do this a lot. So. Yeah. But yeah, see you guys next time.